Here we go. Hello. Welcome to Roll Call. My name is Kayla McNabb. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and we're here to talk about Alice Through the Looking Glass, uh, the game that we played back on February 12th. Um, you may have noticed in the captioning that we might be talking about sharks. We'll see if that comes back up. Uh, I'm joined by several of our uh, players and our game master from that session. Um, and if you missed watching them play that session based on Through the Looking Glass, you can always go back and watch it on our YouTube channel, which is linked in our About section on Twitch. Um, but for this evening, we're going to learn a little bit more about the literature. We're going to talk a little bit about folks' experience playing uh, what our first uh, two-part uh, sequel, our first sequel. Um, and Going to make a few uh, friends yeah. along the so, way. Will we make a, we'll few, make friends? a few friends along the way, maybe? <laughs> Um, what if we, uh, kick it off? Let's see. Anthony is in the upper left corner on my screen. So what if we start there and work our way around? Uh, just remind us who you are, what your pronouns are, uh, what your job is at tech. Sure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I, uh, I use he and they pronouns and I'm the community collections archivist in special collections and university archives at Virginia Tech. Um, in that role, I actually do stream on this channel every Wednesday for a show called Archival Adventures, where I share materials from the archives. Um, for this session, I was playing uh, Emissary Throom, um, who you a character who was a Loxodon um, Horizon Walker Ranger, um, uh, using they them pronouns. Very good. Uh, maybe we should go to Alice next because I saw the look of panic on her face when uh, Anthony started talking about his character. I had to be like, wow, I totally forgot. I'm going to have to look up my character. Um, so why, why would you go to me next after I made that? I know. Uh, that's a harsh thing you just did. <laughs> that was, oh, I'm just I'm making my way around. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a circle. You're below you're right. Anthony on my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, but you also drew my attention. <laughs> uh, my name is Alice Teacher Rogers. noticed you. I hate it. hate it here. Uh, Senpai I noticed use, you. <laughs> I use she, her pronouns, and I am manager of the media design studios here at Virginia Tech. I also do a lot of work behind the scenes for the, uh, for the role of play and roll call often, doing more of the production work. But this, this time I was on screen, and I played Arla Crabtree, who was a druid circle of the something forget that part but um circle of the sun i forget um mm -hmm. she likes she likes mushrooms though that's her that's her big thing defining feature that's good that's perfect she also uses she her right. pronouns jonathan would be next in in this cycle okay. that i've started i'm jonathan bradley i'm head of studios and innovative technologies for the university libraries um, I'm an often GM, uh, sometimes player, sometimes producer. I do a lot of things on the channel. Um, yeah, I just, I ran the game. So I was everybody else. <laughs> exactly. Uh, perfect description of how being a game master yep. works. Uh, and Danny. Hello, um, I'm Danny. I use she, her pronouns. I am a human development and communication science double major, and um, I'm also a student worker at the at the studio. So I do some remote work with making um, advertise, advertising content, and also I, um, I work in studios as well, helping people out um, with equipment and things like that. And my character um, was Lydia. I don't remember her last name, but I uh, but um, she was a fighter and an elf. She's she her pronouns, and um, she really uh, she really enjoyed the enjoys the woods and um, is very like down to earth and energetic and an optimistic person. Awesome, excellent. Well, I have started um, beginning these sessions, these um, episodes with questions that you have for each other. Does anyone have any questions for each other before we dive into some of the other kind of prompts that we have? You can also say no. 
uh, or maybe in a minute. And we can return to that as we get things going. I have a question. So as someone who's um, who's new to or who's newer to D and D, um, this is only I mean this was only my second time playing. The first time I ever played was also in this uh, setting. Um, but I guess for Jonathan, how do you go about um, how do you go about uh, planning? Like how I guess how much planning goes into this? Because obviously what um, what ends up happening in the session is the characters and like we will kind of end up driving the story uh so how how much planning do you do and i guess how like how off the rails or how on track were we in terms of what you had envisioned so that's a very good question um the more i dm the less i plan uh is sort of there's a weird correlation between like amount of time you've been dming and the amount of time you spend preparing for it. Um, and I mean, so all, honestly, a lot of these games have had not that much like prep go into them. And the reason why I prepare less is because the more you prepare, the more you're trying to figure out like what people will do. And you, one, you can't do that. It's, I think the longer you have this experience of DMing the, more you realize you can't predict what they're going to do. And, um, and the more you get stuck into like, um, expectations for what they should do. And you don't want to do that because if you say like, this is the way you beat this thing, then that's not very fun. Then it's just people figuring out what you've envisioned for them. And that's not enjoyable for anyone as a player or as a GM. And so more so my planning especially for these one shots. So there's, there's running a shorter adventure in general. Um, I've been like, figure out three things that they're going to encounter in general. If they, it, it sort of depends on how long the encounter is just generally likely to take. Like if it's a combat, then like, yeah, no more than three counters for a short game like this. If it's maybe a short social interaction, then maybe that's like half a, half an encounter because they're likely to talk and if it's going to be very easy for them to overcome this and then um, maybe add a couple things in there but have a criteria for like what it takes to sort of succeed at this so like if there's a creature and they're somehow barring their way like how do you what do they need to not be barred and the criteria might be multifold there might be like you could get by doing x you could do this you could do this um, it might be that there's really one way to get by, but there's multiple ways to achieve that. So like in the previous game, when we did the Alice in Wonderland, like there was a, there was a win criteria for each one of the challenges. And so there was one criteria for winning, but there were a lot of ways you could have gotten to that, that criteria, you want multiple ways you could have met it. And I, I plan out a few. Can you give a specific example? Sure. For, so for folks? Um, y'all yeah. had the, the caucus race that you did in the previous one. And um, the criteria was you have to have some representation of the Feywild. It could be mirrored. It could be drawn. It could be conceptual. Um, anything along those lines. And you have to go around it three times. And so, I mean, in my mind, it is it is beneficial to imagine ways they might succeed um but know that these are not i one i would argue you should definitely imagine multiple ways they could succeed because if you only imagine one and you spend all your time focused on that one then you're going to decide that's the answer and you should never just decide that's the answer um it's not a bad idea to imagine the multiple ways that people could succeed at it um and so like i had imagined um you know y'all having some sort of mirror ball that you produce with like a ba very basic, simple spell. You could do it with a cantrip and then just going around it three times. You could write the name of the Feywild in the sand and which is actually what y'all's group did. The playtest group, um, they drew a portal that, um, that, that was the portal to the Feywild and they went around their drawing of the portal, which was not a thing I had previously envisioned, but met the criteria. They had a representation of the Feywild and they went around it three times. So, yeah, I come up with some characters too, um, and there are there are some reactions that I will think about, and mostly that's 
my preparation mostly comes from like what exists in the world, like what is happening regardless of what you do. And then once I know that it doesn't really matter. So like y'all came to Alice and she had a very strong reaction when you got to the castle. And that was, I hate it here. I want to go. I'm going to stab this queen as soon as I can. Like that's because what's been happening before y'all and regardless of y'all, if y'all had like gone somewhere else and never made it or I don't know, got lost in the woods and forgot all your names or something like that. Like she was going through a loop every you know, basically like 45 seconds or so. And it was the same loop, same things were being said. And it was driving her crazy. She knew she was in this loop. She had tried every way she could to get out of it. Um, And it was just, she was just basically like broken spirited. And so like, I knew all that was happening and I knew how her personality had grown up until that point. Cause it was basically like, what y'all experienced when in the first session of her just now she's older and has lived this different life. Um, so I was like, yeah, she's going to be frustrated. She's gonna be happy to see y'all, but really frustrated with the situation really, um, just, um, ready to be done with it. So, yeah. And then I, I usually, I usually write a little intro to it and that's because, and this comes to like a piece of advice for anyone who's, who's wanting to run a one shot you got to start where people need to start. That's one of the biggest challenges to a one shot is figuring out where to start your characters. And so I will write the intro that gives you everything you need to know to get you to the starting point, because often the starting point, the right place to start requires that your players have already done a bunch of stuff. And so I sort of try to give you a description of what y'all did leading up to this. So it doesn't feel like I just dropped you into you're in front of a giant mirror like good luck and you have no clue how you got here, what the conversation was with the queen and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes I write like an outro, but usually I don't like, usually that is I, I, the, whatever y'all say to whoever it is at the end is just, that just can be the outro. And that makes most sense when, especially for a short game like this. So a lot of it is a structure Mm -hmm with a few key details because you don't have no details but mostly just letting things happen but this last this game the game that we're talking about today had a very potentially a very linear path Mm -hmm. like they they could have done something very different but they did take a fairly linear path through the challenges in the way that you imagine them so like There's a term in like role playing games called like being on rails. And if you read anything from like DMs and stuff, they'll be like, don't put your people on rails. And players are always like, I hate being on rails. But in general, what players also hate a whole lot is having no guidance and no structure. Like the whole point of the DM is to provide some structure. So like y'all had a path through the the world. I just smacked my microphone for some reason. (laughs) Too energetic with my like gesturing. Like y'all had a path (laughs) through the world. You had a structure and you were going to have conflicts that arose, how you defeated them, how you overcome those. Those are up to you. Um, And like a good story will have that. It'll have a structure. It'll have a place for you to go. You'll know what you need to do next to achieve whatever goals you've set for yourself. But your options for how to achieve those should be up to you. And there should be a lot of room for creativity and like, just play and how you end up getting through those. So like when y'all came up upon the, the sheep, um, who was your lawyer? I mean, really the only criteria was like, you basically have to say like, I want to go like, I want to leave because you're not, because you're in, this is the next step. You haven't committed the crime. So you have to be free in order to commit the crime because everything's in reverse. So all you really have to do is assert that you want to be free. Um, and you can be, and um, so, but how y'all went up, y'all ended up like teleporting out of the thing and <laughs> threatening to kill him. And all. so like you have all these ways of like so solving that, but that's ultimately like, that's all I planned for him was like, he's going to tell you mm-hmm. the structure of like, you're in jail because of this. And then they have to assert they want to be free and everything else. Like I'm not planning anything else beyond that because there's no point in me. If I'm like, well, he's going to say this thing and I'm going to expect them to respond this one. That's not going to work. It's never going to work. It never works that way. Yeah. Uh, 
teleporting out of the cell and threatening to kill him was definitely a different reaction than Thrum would have had in the first session. <clears throat> but it had been 11 years. And Thrum uh, had um, changed a bit. Um, also, I think I played in a little bit there to my reaction and how I play games. Um, which, <laughs> so just that little element of, um, of me snuck into the character there at that part. And I went with it because I was having fun. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, it made sense. What's that sheep going to do? I mean, uh, threatening, intimidation, mm -hmm. that's all part of the game. There's even literally a skill Poor for it. Ken Watanabe. <laughs> for, yeah. Yeah. It's a rough day for him. I did think, like, the actual structure that you put together, the rails that we were on, <clears throat> looking back at it, and, and you know, it came out during the game that I'm not, by any means, a chess expert. But um, you know, we were essentially on a chess board, and we were told at the very beginning, you are pawns, which mm -hmm. basically dictated, I think, how we proceeded from then on. We moved forward like a pawn right. would. Um because uh, pawns go forward unless they're attacking diagonally. They can only move forward, if I remember correctly. Yep. Or possibly back. I don't know the I don't know the rules to chess very well. <laughs> they, they can only move forward unless they become a queen. They get to the other side of the board. Um Alice, are you muted? Yeah, I'm muted. Sorry, I had muted because my dogs were making loud noises while they while they you know, lick each other's faces. My dogs will be a frequent frequent feature Classic. in today's in today's stream because that's just that's just how it is. Um, yeah, no, they can they can move diagonally if they take a piece. Like if you take yeah. a piece, um, but mostly moving forward, which is you know we we technically broke that because we move forward, you know, into into a, a space with something in it, right? Yeah, uh, but mm -hmm. you know that's fine. It doesn't have to totally follow the rules of chess. It's also a fantasy world. <laughs> I also fantasy think, chess. Also, they the, weren't. The pieces, things in the spaces so. didn't manifest until we were in the space. Yeah. So, so we, we couldn't were know forward. ahead. Yeah. I mean, you could just look at it like the knight moved into your space to attack you, but y'all were not having any of that. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. That's fair. That makes more sense. Um, the most but, frustrating puzzle for me was Humpty Dumpty. I would agree with that. <laughs> oh, Humpty Dumpty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the the win criteria there was just knock them off the wall somehow. Yeah. <clears throat> it took way I mean, too that's... long for us to think of that. What yeah, I know. Like, we, tried, I go, uh, we tried going through it. I think I tried flying over it. Um, I, I think I shot at him with an arrow or something. I don't remember. I think that's what it was. Off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, y'all tried a lot that's of so pacifists. Funny attempts which i appreciate like i appreciate y'all being like we don't want to kill flumpty dumpty yeah but he was a jerk he was he purposely was. a jerk i wanted to make him i wanted y'all to want to knock him off the which wall. is funny because our lawyer was really not so much of a jerk and we still yeah. try like attempted not attempted threatened to kill mm -hmm. threatened i, I yeah. just remember i was i tried i think it was at that point where i tried to use my um ability that let me go into the ethereal plane and you're like there's no ethereal plane and i was like this is like the best ability my character has and now i can't use it yeah, yeah. cuz you're in a you're basically in someone's like mental prison no it, it yeah, made that, sense why it wasn't there but it was also like man i was ongoing taken this. <laughs> that's an ongoing uh, just wanted to walk through walls ongoing trait with uh anthony and i because i dm other campaigns and <laughs> everything cool his character can do he keeps ending up in situations where he can't use them i'm like oh yeah all of my abilities are aimed in this direction and we're facing enemies that are completely immune to everything mm. i do <laughs> I, I promise you that is not on purpose <laughs> As much as it's starting to seem that way. <laughs> Happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a good question. That was a good question. That was a very good question. Danny, oh. do we have any other questions? I'm yeah. good for now. Amongst ourselves. Yeah, I mean, as a summary, like, I think for most all of these one shots, I have about a page and a half of, like, prep material. 
Um, and we're going to start sharing op- those at some point, right? Like we have a website. Yeah. Is that yeah, is that a secret? It's not a secret. secret. It we just doesn't really. Website. It's not really up anywhere yet. But yeah, yeah we're but we plan to have a website. Those. I haven't seen it. It's not no, up it's, yet. <laughs> okay. It's a blank page right now. So it's not oh, okay, okay, <laughs> cool. So I'm not missing much. No. Yeah, there's not not a lot of exciting stuff on there. But we do intend to start sharing some of these game documents <clears> and stuff, and. Um, uh, that'll be that'll be part of it. Uh, weird little prep. A lot of it's monster information because there's so much about monsters if they're going to fight that you have mm-hmm. to know. And um, beyond that, it's mostly like, I mean, the one for this one looked like tile one, nothing. They're here to look around. Tile two, <laughs> they get a message from the queen that says your pawns. Uh, like I think that's literally all it says. It's like tile three. I don't remember which one tile three was it now, but um, one of them was like, there's a deer. He his, thinks his name is an acorn. He can't remember <laughs> anything else. The longer they stay here, it's a DC <laughs> like 18 wisdom check to see if they forget their name. And then yeah, like, that's all <laughs> right. That's like, that's like all the notes are is, you know, and then I'm just like, you know, I'll wing the rest of it because I, there's no point in planning anything more than that. Mm hmm. Especially for a one shot, because right. um, it can be, it's hard to condense down to just three hours, no matter what, um, for sure, for sure. Um, that actually, that leads me to the, to the next question. And I think because this group specifically has played through two sessions together, um, you're in a kind of a unique position uh to talk about like your expectations going into the game since you had played in this kind of like uh i mean not not artificially like actually time controlled uh place uh together before um what were your expectations going into the session the second session um was anything kind of not what you expected um, I definitely, after the first, um, so, because uh, again, last time was my first time ever playing D&D, um, so I had definitely, I was definitely expecting a lot more combat, um, and more, I guess, like, straightforward puzzles, and so I really enjoyed all of the, like, tricky, like, mind, mind game ways that we had to solve all of the challenges that were set in front of us. So I really appreciated that. And so I was definitely kind of expecting that more going into the second session as opposed to the first session. I definitely felt completely caught off guard, which wasn't a bad thing at all. Like I I really enjoyed that. Um, However, I think we'd actually talked about this during the session last time. I was surprised by the combat, like the traditional combat in the in this second campaign because i feel like you know last campaign it was set up where we didn't have any traditional combat and everything was like there was some sort of trick to kind of get through or some sort of criteria to get through so i think the yeah i was definitely expecting it to be similar where the puzzles had to be solved um using you know like tricks or like mind things um so then the traditional combat kind of came out of nowhere and i was like oh okay my first like actual like D combat thing yeah i put that combat in there because there is legitimate combat in the second in through the looking glass like the, the oh, white okay. knight and the red knight have a battle and it is on alice's behalf the white knight is there to protect alice from the red knight and i was like i didn't really give them a traditional combat last time and um i also know that max really enjoys traditional combat so i was like (laughs) all right i'm gonna i'm gonna throw one out there for them uh so that they they can have a fight and actually really because the other side of it is you know you got to be higher level this time and so you're in this weird world and it's difficult to always use your powerful abilities the way you might want to and so i was like i mean a traditional combat will let them use their abilities as you know they've gotten and have a chance to really like try some things out with their higher level characters so i was like i'll throw i'll throw a normal one at him he's just a knight i mean he was basically a death knight uh that had been slightly tweaked from his traditional stats um and a couple things changed and switched in and out um which is for the for the listeners out there who might not be familiar, a Death Knight is a 
uh, creature from the monster manual from fifth edition. Um, it's a pretty high level monster, but y'all were high level characters. So I was like, um, they, I mean, you hope you, hopefully you can take it. <laughs> it was a little touch and go there, but you know, we did all right. Yeah. For me, I wasn't sure, uh, kind of what to expect because I honestly didn't remember through the looking glass very well. Um, I remember, you know, Alice's adventures in Wonderland, the first book, pretty well and then all i really remembered about uh looking glass was the jabberwocky which we encountered in the first session so i didn't yeah. expect to encounter it again um but then you know once the chess portion came into it and like i recognized all the elements i just uh didn't exactly know what to expect going in um the one thing that i was worried about going in was would I even be able to recreate the voice that I did the first time around? And I think I <laughs> sort of got it some of the time. Um, I think most of the time. I think it was all good. All of the time. Yeah. yeah. I, I do not remember thinking, ah, oh, Throom sounds, sounds not like Throom here. They <laughs> sounded pretty mm-hmm. consistent. So I think you did great. Yeah. Voices are hard. Yeah. It That's was months. <laughs> like, if I had done it a week later, like, if this had followed directly on the other one, it would have been easy. But we had, like, three months between sessions Mm -hmm. and figuring I had to go back and watch the first one Mm. to remember what I had done and recreate it. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a risk taking on a voice for a character. So I know I do not hear the specificity of voices enough Mm. to be able to consistently recreate one. Is the concern. It's tough. Yeah. Well, we've touched on this a little bit, um, and it's probably a good time to give us the overall description, Jonathan, of this work. So we're kind of in the context of the first session being Alice in Wonderland plus Jabberwocky, really. Right. There's, like, there's that a couple of things Alice that overlap in, and, in weird ways, but that's just sort of what Alice in Wonderland has become in like sure. modern day like representation. So I don't feel bad about that. Um, I mean, Alice sure. in Wonderland, um, or Alice through the looking glass. I don't know why uh, Lewis Carroll really likes basing a book off of a like common game, but I mean, cards and playing card games are really heavily featured in Alice in Wonderland and chess is really heavily featured in Through the Looking Glass but essentially Alice goes through a mirror in her house um, and ends up back in this time it's actually it's not Wonderland and I don't actually remember Um, it's just the mirror world it's Through the Looking Glass and I think she calls it Mirror House at one point um, but then she leaves the house, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't make a lot of sense to continue calling it mirror house. Um, and she begins her trip through this strange world. Um, she is told some of the stuff that y'all were told, like time moves backwards here, which isn't really true. Um, it's more of a like a funny joke that's thrown out there. Um, and that is one of the the what happened to y'all is the example from the book. Like someone commits a crime, they. Um, like they'll have their trial they'll or they'll go to prison first and they'll have their trial and then they'll like commit the crime like later. Um, so I was like, that'd be funny. I'll put them in there and see <laughs> <laughs> and have a lawyer come talk to them. Um, she ends up in a woods. It's just a forgetful woods. She meets a deer. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff here was taken a little bit more literally um, from it. The, um, she does meet chess pieces. She meets a red queen and a white queen, and she's told she needs to get to the end of the chessboard to become a queen, similar to the way y'all were. Um, and when she does, she has a big banquet, um, and she eventually like wakes up. But there is there's an offhanded line, and it's actually considered one of the more famous lines in there um, that Tweedledee and Tweedledum um, tell her, and that is, "All you are is in the mem- You're in the dream of the Red King who sleeps all the time." Um, which I don't know if Lewis Carroll was familiar with um, like Taoism and um, the um, I don't I can't say his name but um, the famous Taoist philosopher who who has the the story of the um, 
I had a dream I was a butterfly, and when I woke up, I wasn't sure if I was a butterfly dreaming of a man to be that I was a man, or if I was a man dreaming I was a butterfly. Um, and so it, it is essentially a little bit of that. Like, are you is she sleeping and dreaming of this world, or is the Red King sleeping dreaming of her? Um, and so that has sort of stood the test of time as one of the more interesting like implications in the in this children's book. Um, and so that was the one I was like, that's what I think I'm going to grab a hold of too, because it also makes, um, it lets me do the same thing I did in the first one, which was not have the obvious easy antagonist, which would have been the, the red queen. It was she, who the, you know, that's one of the tricks is we think of the queen from Alice in Wonderland as the red queen, but she is the queen of hearts in Alice in Wonderland. The red queen is from through the looking glass and she is a chess piece. She's represented as the chess piece on a, a chessboard. Um, but the red queen would have been the easy villain. And, and in my first thought of it, that was sort of where I was headed. And I was like, no, I like this idea that there's not really an antagonist at all in this situation. You've just sort of gotten drawn into this weird mess and there's people who seem like antagonists, but really this is just sort of an accident of a really magical, powerful place. And the story content in that situation led me to be able to do that. And it also let me have a chase scene, which I thought would be fun as y'all had to go all the way back through all of the, <laughs> all of the things you'd already been through and have your trial uh, and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Also the sheep, is in yeah, the, the sheep's in the book too. The sh but is not your lawyer. No, he runs a shop. Um, the sheep situation is real weird. The whole thing <laughs> through in through the looking glass is very strange because there's a lot of just like she's just somewhere else, and now something else weird is happening. And there's not like a lot of story transition from how they get to that place to the other. So like she's talking to the sheep in the shop at one point in time. He's trying to sell her something, and then like all of a sudden they're on a boat. And he's like rowing around and then all of a sudden they're back in the shop and she can't take anything off the shelf. Like there's a lot of weird like jumping around and then all of a sudden she's in like a town square um, and there's a Which, unicorn I mean, and a lion to, fighting. Like, that's true to how people dream though too, right? Like yeah. that people that's when they true. dream like you don't have like the transitions between like moments that you remember are not particularly strong. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. The, but the weird part of it is, is Alice in Wonderland is also heavily implied to be a dream. But I think through the looking glass seems more dreamlike. Because it has mm. that disjointed structure to it. Yeah, that's fair. Are there pieces of media where this part of the story is actually featured more? That made for TV, like NBC special. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also for a while Disney had a live action Alice in the Wonderland television show and I, more of that more of the chess motif and some of the characters from the Through the Looking Glass make a little bit more of an appearance in those stories although it does still heavily rely on like Mad Hatter, Cheshire Cat and all that sort of stuff the, I know the Red Queen and the White Queen come up in King's Quest 6 video game oh. um, and there's there's an entire island in that game that kind of is references to um, Alice in Wonderland or, or more particularly to Through the Looking Glass I think yeah interesting yeah not as pervasive in our kind of popular culture in America at least I'm not sure about if it might be different in the UK potentially um but yeah we're definitely <clears throat> much more familiar with some of the events of the the kind of first part uh and i know jonathan and i were talking about some of the components that might go into this as he was planning and i was none of that um, basically none of that was familiar to me <laughs> yeah it is it is a difference it's like i'm here to come up with names for <laughs> sheep and like you know that's that's mostly puns. It. you're here for the puns uh, puns <laughs> yeah. right so i do want to i do want to say um this this second adventure was inspired by something y'all said at the end of the first adventure i don't remember who it was and y'all might remember but someone said when we when y'all were leaving the castle and you were leaving alice with the queen said maybe you could teach her some magic um and i went 
she could be a warlock. Uh, and from there, like the whole thing just like spawned and, and went from like that direction of, I was like, she could teach her magic. Um, and she probably would because she likes cultivating this. And that's what happens when you learn magic from like a powerful archfey, you become a warlock. Um, and so I was like, oh, now we're going to have to have a sequel because <laughs> I want to see what warlock Alice, uh, running off on her own adventure and getting stuck somewhere, uh, was, uh, <laughs> there was interest in what prompted that decision from our audience. Ooh. Yeah, it was, it yeah. was that co- whoever made that comment. I don't remember who it was, but I, I remember stopping for a moment at that point, like mentally and being like, Hey, I feel like Alice. that was probably Alice's character. Yeah. I think cause she, she was concerned that she didn't know how to read and she was like, <laughs> also like this is a literacy (laughs) this is a literacy show so i was like you should teach how to read um (laughs) but also like bare minimum please you know you can also teach her some magic and i remember like talking to her about teaching and you know yeah that 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 all sounds familiar Uh, yeah we can we can fact check it later there you go you can take credit for the torment that you eventually had to go through (laughs) (laughs) i mean we do have a recording of it and if anyone would like to watch that session is also available on our youtube channel which you can go back and see through our exactly through our about page on twitch um for sure it's there for posterity you can check it out um, let's see. So we've talked about kind of the, the process, the challenges of adapting this work to a tabletop RPG a little bit already. Um, so I think I'd like to talk a little bit if you have any, um, any of that previous experience. I know we talked about not having read the book recently, the, through the looking glass and what I was found there. But are there other, either other themes from that work of literature or other themes from kind of your experience going through both of these sessions that y'all would have liked to explore more as players that maybe you didn't get a chance to because of kind of the constraints of the, the session or of the encounters? I mean, I'm always up for more pun puzzles. <laughs> like... <laughs> eh, eh. <laughs> I, I really enjoy the kind of creativity of the the way that the puzzles functioned and I I that's one of kind of the things that I enjoy about the book is kind of that bending of expectation and so um, to have that applied to a gaming system that I really like which is D and D was quite enjoyable I, I liked it a lot yeah I'm usually not very good at puns. So I, I will take the, the praise uh, because I'm, I'm normally not given any praise when it comes to puns. Sometimes you just need a good workshop. Yeah. You I mean, mo- and you got to workshop a pun. A the little best bit. pun in the game was you, too. You came up with that. I didn't come up with the sheep's name. <laughs> oh, want to It's great. Um, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I guess this isn't really something that I want to add, but I think I've never read either of the books. So, um, my only exposure to Alice in Wonderland is the Disney movie, um, like the original animated one, because I watched it when I was, you know, a kid. And, um, I, uh, like, like you said earlier, Kayla, I think that Alice in Wonderland has does have a role in like pop culture, but it's more of the first one as opposed to like through the looking glass. But what I thought was interesting is that some of the more popular and well-known parts of the original book weren't the parts that you focused on. And I, I liked that actually, because when I think of Alice in Wonderland, I think of like the tea party, I think of the Cheshire cat, like Tweedledee to Tweedledum, like the flowers. I don't even know if the flowers were a part of the book. I just remember the song they sing in the movie is really cute. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, and I know the Cheshire Cat was in the first one that we did, um, but, you know, 
he didn't even really play like that big of a role. So I actually really liked that you chose some of the portions of the book that like I had never heard of or it had experienced. And um, actually, it makes me want to like go and read the books now because I've never I've never read them. Mm. I've only ever seen the seen the Disney movie. That's the whole goal of the program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people want to read. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the flowers do appear, but they are in uh, through the looking glass. They're one of the first things that Alice encounters are. Oh. They're actually, I think, as I recall, they're a little mean. Um, they think she's supposed to be a flower. Well, like, well, I guess they're mean in the movie, too. Cause the, they're a little mean. In yeah. The they're movie. like, yeah, hey, your well, petals are all messed up. <laughs> Well, they sing this, like, really, like, lovely song that I loved as a kid. And then all of a sudden there's just, like, this tonal shift. And I think they realize she's not a flower. And they just all berate her and then, like, tear her dress up and throw water on her. And she runs out. It, honestly, like, looking back, it kind of scared me as a little kid. Like, there are a lot of parts of that movie that I was, like, horrified of. <laughs> hey, it isn't classic children's media unless it also terrifies you a little bit. That is that is mm-hmm. very true. But yeah, it's not inaccurate. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was a little surprised that. So I wasn't sure how. I I haven't read it in a while, but I remember when I read Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass, I had read the annotated Alice as well, where they give a lot of information about like, like like things that were specific to like Victorian England and commentary on like Victorian behavior. That's um, really cool. And I, I was wondering if that would be incorporated in any way. Um, and I think that would be something that's interesting to explore. We have plenty of other Victorian British novels and works yeah. to potentially explore some of that more in less of a um, like, you know, bright and fantastical world. Like, you know, it made sense to sort of, not necessarily because that was all that's all like under current stuff it's not necessarily on the surface yeah i'll be leaving all of the exploration of victorian culture to kira um so kira can feel free to take that on that's <laughs> not for me thanks just all of just that. all of it just <laughs> on, there's none of it for you just wait for the pride and prejudice and zombies uh <laughs> one shot Kira's in the chat and she just said huzzah, yeah, huzzah. Or, or the <laughs> sense and sensibility and sea She's monsters it, I think. android Karenina like all of them are wonderful wonderful adaptations of the original books um, and now I now I feel like we need to do one shots on the uh, the quirk books adaptation the I mean, I mean thinking, thinking about a few pieces of literature and ones that have a very distinct place in time that they represent I think would be a good idea for the channel and something we should maybe do like a little mini series on. Cause so what I would really like to figure out and I'm still pondering it and I don't know how to do it yet. I want to, so one of my favorite television series is over the garden wall and it captures a place and a time in American history that is fascinating and part of me really wants to figure out how to capture that same sense um, in a one shot, like a D and D adventure or something like that. Oh, I got a hand raised. What, what are you, yeah. Do you have the so answer? I have no idea what over the garden wall is. So could you oh, explain? Okay. Yeah. So over the garden wall is a, um, it's an animated series. It was, a, it was a um, mini series. It is not an ongoing series. Mm-hmm. It had 10 episodes and that is it. That's all there ever will be. Um, they are all like 15 minute episodes and they are set in, um, the unknown, which closely resembles, um, Americana around like, I guess the late 1800s. Um, and Mm -hmm. it, yeah, no spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers beyond that. But, um, it, 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 one, it's everything has a very stark sense of fall. It takes place in the fall, Mm -hmm. like slash winter. And so, it, it just does a really great job with the music and the setting and the, the creatures and people that everybody meets and, and interact of capturing like this place in time um, and telling a weird fantastical story that is not set in a fantasy world. That I think is, is one of the most amazing things about it is it is a fantastical story, but the setting is, is very much not fantastical in the sense that we're used to it, like 
here's some dragons and whatnot and castles and knights and stuff. And uh, it's an amazing series. I highly recommend it to anyone who enjoys. I mean, I'm just going to say good storytelling. Uh, you don't have to enjoy animation and animated stories. Just it's a, it's a really great story just in general. Mm-hmm. Delightful music. Does have delight. I have the soundtrack to it on vinyl because I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's the kind of nerds we are. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. That's a great. That's a great example. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. If folks have suggestions for um, for small series of uh, role of play one shots we would love to hear suggestions uh if folks have specific pieces of literature we would also love to hear those um the what is it role of play dash g at vt dot edu is our email address and contact information will be in the chat on uh twitch if you want to share ideas we would love to have them i'd love to see like a mini series of like let's let's focus on like setting and place Different settings, not all in Victorian England. Sorry, Kira. But uh, (laughs) (laughs) a little little variety. variety. Yeah. Hmm. I'm pondering. Mm. Mm. You haven't GM'd yet. You should you should get you an answer. Right. I have right. Uh, I have a lot of um, anxiety around not being good enough. We're all being You've honest. You've been GMing. Just in general. Much more experienced you know. than I am. <laughs> I've, I've done one. <laughs> You've been uh, GMing for quite a while. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're not going to pressure you while we're on air. Um, okay. We'll pressure you when we're off right. air. We'll save that yeah. for off later. Air. Off air for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. I am. I have been putting a little bit of thought. This is uh, premature for like things we're looking forward to because I don't know if you should look forward to it yet. Uh, putting some thought into uh, a session uh, based on the fall of the House of Usher. Uh, Jonathan and I have talked a little bit about it. Um, I'm a fan of some Edgar Allan Poe. So I've been reading some more Poe. That may be a thing that could exist possibly sometime in the future. If you would be into that, people, uh, you know, tell me. That pressure might be helped. <laughs> <coughs> so we've got a we've got a <laughs> we've got an affirmative from Kira in the chat. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, see, I've been American thinking Gothic. about DMing, and I have never DM'd at all. Well, that's not true. I DM'd like a few little things here and there, well, but those were so much more set. The second session that I the second game I ever DM'd, period was on on stream for the sheep look up like i had done one before that and with a new game system yes a brand new game system (laughs) like it was a a 5e supplement that came out a week before we aired so you did excellent yeah like (laughs) yeah i I know there's a lot of anxiety about it (laughs) and i i probably don't exude that because i've been doing this for so long but um, I just want to encourage people like if, if you are interested in it we, we are happy to help you yeah and folks from our community if you're interested in leading a session but you feel like you need you know like some professional development around this or to bat some ideas around uh, you can also reach out to us about that yeah we actually give appointments specifically for DMing and you can find them on our calendar which i'll just post post over here on on the twitch stream here it goes there it is there you go. go feel free to is make an appointment in our consultation it list. is indeed tabletop rpg facilitation is is a category you can book us with along with many others advertisement over uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Running uh, tabletop RPG sessions is a great way to uh, improve your communication skills and uh, help folks that might want to play with you improve their communication and teamwork skills. So wait, can I'm going to ask you know, a question plug. now? Um, for those of you here, uh, 
what have you gained most from either DMing or just playing D&D in general? Like, what's what are things that you feel like you have gained the most from doing tabletop RPGs? I mean, I know my answer. I didn't want to jump on it, though, because I've talked a lot. Do y'all want do y'all need time to think about your answers? Yes. OK, well, you should go. <laughs> <then I'll> go. <laughs> uh, an opportunity to live another life. Um, yeah. I I don't remember when it started. It was pretty young. I be, I grew to resent the idea that in life I really only got like one shot. Like you have this path that to a very real degree is a lot of it established for you. Um, from when you're born, you grow up in this area, this place, um, and have all these various traits about yourself that are set for you and your ability to manipulate them. You have some autonomy, but there is also a lot that you can't control. Like you can't control where you were born. You can't control like a lot of your upbringing, um, for a very long period of your life. And so, you know, even with the control that you have, there's still, you know, a, a pretty, you know, I will say like a wide path that you get to follow. You can, you can walk back and forth and you can waver a bit, but it's there. And mostly playing for me, I, I get a lot of storytelling opportunity out of it, which I just enjoy in general. But for, as a player, um, being able to say, I want to know what it would be like to be this, this for a while. And, you know, it's not a hundred percent, but it's, close enough and it's a lot of fun to do it that way and um i mean at at the end of the day it offers me something that it's hard to get otherwise makes sense i would say especially when you're running a game when you're a game master but also sometimes as a player depending on who you're playing with um it's like tiny um exposure therapy to uncertainty like (laughs) there's a lot um i know particularly as like an adolescent it would have been helpful for me to have tiny exposure therapy to uncertainty to like get used to that earlier on but i definitely feel more capable now of like yes anding more frequently um not always because sometimes the answer is no (laughs) um but (laughs) definitely uh, I feel better able to adapt on my feet because of having that experience. For me, oh, go ahead, Danny. No, you can go. I I was just going to say, for for me, um, when I was younger, I I was into theater, did acting, things like that, and uh, decided not to pursue that as a career. Um, And so... For me, uh, the role-playing game gives me an opportunity to do something that I really enjoyed, um, but to do it in a smaller setting, um, even when it was streamed online, it it feels more intimate um, than being up on stage in front of an entire group of people with set lines that I have to remember and deliver properly, etc. So the the improvisational nature of it, being able to think on your feet and react as a character, um, but getting sort of that acting type experience of being able to embody the character and take it on as a role, um, for me, it kind of touches on that kind of acting nostalgia I had from when I was younger, as well as... um, improving on improvisation uh, and improving on performance because I do have to like deliver lectures and do things like that for work. And this has definitely helped with my confidence and reduced my stage fright and things like that. Yeah. Um, I think for me, cause I mean, again, I've only played twice, but I think specifically with these two sessions that we did, I think it really encouraged me to or gave me practice in like thinking outside the box because I feel like, cause I mean, every single solution that we came up with was unconventional and I love puzzles like that. And I don't think I've 
been in a situation where that's something that I've encountered in my day-to-day life. So I liked that freedom to kind of like, you know, flex those creative muscles you don't always get to use and um and look at a problem without constraints because, you know, in the when you're when we were placed in the Feywild, all of a sudden the rules of reality don't really apply anymore. And so I really liked having the opportunity to explore that. Um, and then I think also, uh, similar to what Anthony said, is just, is, you know, getting the chance to embody new characters. And as someone who also is really into theater, um, I did like theater in middle school and high school, and I miss it. And so uh, I think it's fun to like try out new characters. Um, and uh, as a very like indecisive, not, uh, not, always like confident person I think I think Lydia was that like very decisive very optimistic very very sure that everything was going to work out and um I liked putting on that persona and I think that's something that I strive to embody more of so being in a situation where I got that chance to do that I don't know that was it was it was a lot of fun for me what about you Alice you don't get to ask a, uh dang it um, don't I get to do like that <laughs> not answer <laughs> I don't have to answer. Oh, no. I was feeling that I was assuming that I didn't you don't have, have to. to. You know, I no, asked. Yeah, I hope you were thinking you don't about have it. To. It's it's an opt in. I yeah, I gas No. Okay. Um yeah, I think that all the answers, certainly all of the above is a component of it, right? Um but I think that uh, a major component is definitely being able to have like sort of aspirational characters, right? Like characters who embody things that you wish that you did better um, or uh, embody different things, even some things that you like don't wish that you did or were like. Um, there's certain, is a combination of those and sort of understanding, understanding various characteristics and coming to terms with them. Um, I think it can teach you a lot about yourself in that way. Um, and I think that's really great. I also feel like it is a, like for me, like it's a, obviously I get to play with all my wonderful coworkers, but I've been able to play with some other people in like, you know, the New River Valley community. And that's been a really great way to get to know someone in a certain kind of way, because you, mm-hmm. your characters are already acquainted in one way or another. And so, you know, instead of being like, hi, like, what are your hobbies you know it's just like no i mean your characters are just like battling some rats in the bottom of a basement you know um that's just that classic classic story story, right like um you know it it makes it it makes it easier to to just have like a thing that you're doing together and i think it's a lot of fun in that way um and it has like a lot of community building components and when other people especially if other people play tabletop role-playing games there's a lot of things that you can talk about immediately it's a big community and there's a lot of like really wonderful components to that community um what was so I what say? you're saying is that to bring people together and create friendships we need to build a tavern and fill it with giant rats in the that's basement. exactly correct yes absolutely <laughs> two thousand percent I mean, wear rats if we're being very specific, I think. Oh, my gosh. Hey, no, because you hire the wear rats to run your tavern for you. <laughs> no spoilers. No, you hire the street urchins to run your tavern for you. I don't understand why. This is a core disagreement was, we have. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, what was I? Go- there was another thing I was going to say, and I've forgotten. This is about the puzzles and problem solving and things like that. Oh, another thing that mm-hmm. I find really great about tabletop role playing games that is more true to life and less true to like say video games. Like so, a lot of people, I think a lot of people come to tabletop role playing games from video games or ha- having had experience with video games these days. Probably not, you know, earlier, but today definitely. And video games unlike sort of what Jonathan was talking about earlier, have a very set, like if to fix a problem, they have a set number of ways in which you can fix that problem almost always. And so the creators have thought of every single way that they want you to have to fix that problem. There's no, if you think of something creative, that's a solution. Sometimes like you can do things that like break the game and then you can fix like, you know, fix a problem or fix an encounter. But usually it's a matter of, you know, finding the routes or one of the many routes that, um, you know, creators have put into their games. Whereas here, like it's much more collaborative. And if you come up with a great solution, then you will be rewarded for it. Even if it's like silly or tricky or, um, you know, you can have different solutions outside of what 
the creator of this world envisioned. And I think that that is something that's both true to life, like that, you know, you can, you can kind of maneuver in different ways, um, but also just like way, way more fun in some ways. Well, it's interesting that you brought that up because you did a comparison to video games. I know that that was what what you're describing there is exactly one of the reasons why Breath of the Wild was um, so highly like reviewed because people felt like there wasn't a way to that that there was no like these are the five ways you beat this puzzle or this challenge to yeah. it that there was just the design was more like what I was talking about where they're like, here's an Island. Mm -hmm. There's this shrine you have to get to on it. It's got spikes around the base of the shrine. And there's some like enemies who spit like whatever at you. And there's water surrounding it, whatever, use whatever you got, figure it out. Like if you want to soar in on your, like go jump off a mountain and soar in, you can do that. If you want to like climb over the spikes and blow them up, you can, if you want to like, so it has that element of like, what way can I just, you know, figure this out. And I just, I really just have a destination for it. I agree. But I also th would say not to make this a breath of the wild podcast, but I think but also there's also, but, <laughs> 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 um, but I think also that like a lot of it is that they just have thought of a kabillion ways for you to do a thing. Like, and I also feel like there's a lot of intentionality in that game. It's like, I wonder if I could climb up this mountain. I bet the creators didn't think I could climb up this mountain. And then you find a Korok seat at the top. They in fact did know that you were going to climb up that mountain. Like there's a lot of them just anticipating way more things than we, typically see in a video game and i think it's well, just having higher more routes whether, than we're typically used to whether that's true or not really depends on whether or not you trust the developers i watched a, like a 30 minute thing where they were talking to the developers and they claim that they did not create paths for you to solve things that they did just make like win conditions and they were like because there was this whole thing about the chemistry physics system that they built for it and how they were like this just we are just giving you these tools and you can do whatever you want with them and that's why people have like figured out how to get into the castle like in like before 10 they minutes leave. or whatever yeah like before they ever leave the yeah. plateau and stuff yeah stasis yeah. man not to, not to <laughs> also jump on the breath of the wild train <laughs> Um, but, uh, <laughs> hi everyone. Welcome to breath talk where we talk about breath. Yeah, the no, it, I, like, but you have to press more than one button at a time and I can't, <laughs> I can't. It's such a I good game. Um, it's, an amazing well, game. But it's so, it's so, it's so interesting because yeah, Alice, when you were originally talking about the, the amount of creativity, I also, Jonathan was like thinking about breath of the wild and how it allows, and because like you said, I think there was a lot of intentionality in them allowing you to do that. And I think also with the freedom that the developers of Breath of the Wild gave us, and then also like Jonathan did in our when he created this Feywild where, you know, a lot of stuff's just up in the air, it allows for such a variety in, um, in outcomes and encounters and difficulty. Like I know in Breath of the Wild, like, um, there was this one tower and one of my friends was like, oh, that one gave me so much trouble. And I just like somehow miraculously bypassed a bunch of enemies that he just so happened to like run into just because of luck. Um, cause I came in at a different angle than he did. Um, and cause you know, there isn't one set path. And so I think Jonathan, you had mentioned during our first Alice in Wonderland playthrough where the playtest group had, uh, had done something like way differently than we had. Um, and I, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's cool because even if the, even if all of the outcomes aren't planned out, there's so, there's so much intentionality in allowing for the diversity in the paths you take that it, it allows everyone to have like a unique experience. And I appreciate that about both your campaigns and then also Breath of the Wild. <laughs> yeah, I think what you're talking about there was the, the playtest group molded the, the Jabberwocky's head out of clay and then like yeah. fired it in an oven so that they had its head and then told a story about how when they got back to the guards about how they had severed the head from the Jabberwocky. Um, and mm -hmm. that was enough to like have the wind condition. So very different from what y'all did. Yeah. Well, I mean, we like actually, I mean, we did have to eventually tell the story, but we also, I mean, we fought it or at least mm -hmm. tried to. Um, but yeah, I mean the fact that, you know, we were able to do that. Um, 
at all is just is really cool we did also fight in until we were almost dead i was in the playtest group <laughs> and then we were like we're done now we're gonna go we're done we're now gonna with go fighting the jabberwocky yeah. yeah am i allowed to ask kind of an yeah. off topic but also on topic <laughs> question do it yes Sure. What happens if someone dies in D&D? Like, I know it probably depends on the DM. It's a good But, question. like, Jonathan, if, let's say that I had died in the night battle in our Alice Through the Looking Glass playthrough, what would you have done if I had died in the night battle, for instance? Like, what would have happened? I guess I would have hoped, first off, that as high level as y'all were, y'all had some raise spells, but I actually didn't check your character sheet, so I don't know. So, like, once you get past a certain level, like, bringing someone back to life who's died is pretty trivial, really. Okay. So, like, once you reach, like, fifth level. But also you don't die immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So that maybe so maybe you should explain yeah, that. Yeah, so in D and D at least first. it's different for other game systems. When you hit zero hit points, you go into a, a dying state essentially, and oh, on your okay. on your next three turns, you you roll a dice, and um, you roll if you're less than ten, you get a death mark, um, a fail, and if you get over ten, then they're you, death saves, or you get a positive, you get yep. a, a save for your um, your rolls. And if you get three in either direction, that dictates what happens. So if you get three failures, then you die, die. If you get three positives, then you stabilize. You're unconscious, but you are sort of your bleeding stopped enough that you're not like bleeding out and dying. Um, so that also gives people time to get you up. And, and most experienced players usually know like when someone goes down got to get them a health potion got to use a healing spell or something Mm -hmm. and so someone actually dying is usually the product of like a really difficult battle that you know you're fighting a boss and there's a whole bunch of people and other people can't help you um probably because they're also dying um is usually when when that happens and it spirals pretty quickly um if a single person does die, um, which which can happen, and the rest of the group is still alive, if they're high enough level, they often just cast spells to bring you back to life. So a fifth level okay. spell, if you've died within the last minute, um, so usually like right after a battle, you can bring somebody back to life. And then higher level spells can bring people back to life all the way up to like 200 years or something like that. And they don't even have to exist anymore. You just have to know their name and like speak their name into the ether and cast the spell and they will just magically like it's called true resurrection they just they just magically appear and out of, have a diamond of yeah, sufficient wow. um, yeah. so there there is a certain point it's expensive yeah. the bigger concern <laughs> with with D more so than a single person dying unless it's at low level because there is there's not a lot of recourse for like a first level party and the wizard gets hit by that ogre or whatever and he's gone and you're just saying goodbye to that character um <laughs> but like the bigger concern is usually a, a total party kill which we uh shorten to tpks a lot you'll hear people say oh tpk like incoming that's usually someone's indication that really looks like we're all gonna die like um those are the m- bigger concern and Honestly, in most battles with a single combatant like y'all were fighting in either one of mm-hmm. those, it's really hard to do a TPK in D&D 5th edition. The game is sort of balanced okay. to make that hard. Most TPKs happen when you're fighting a bunch of people because everybody gotcha. has mm-hmm. to have their attention on someone who's attacking them versus like when it's a single person, usually one or two people who are still up will go engage while someone else goes to like bring somebody back up and heal them and and help so yeah but i mean if you and like jonathan said that is a fifth edition thing prior to fifth edition sometimes one antagonist could take down a whole party and i mean they was a they still can it's just much more difficult to do and, mm-hmm. yeah. and and honestly, though, I would say if you're TPKing people in a one shot, that's not a that's not a great well designed one. unless it's intentional. One-shot. Yeah, unless, unless it's, it's intentional. <laughs> yeah, unless it's yeah, unless it's the alien role playing game. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Where based on the movie series <laughs> when everyone's yeah. supposed to die. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also a uh, number of people do homebrew rules that you might see, like if you watch or listen to podcasts where people die in the um, in the campaign, they might make it harder to revive them. So like typically it's a 
I don't even know if there's a check for Revivify. Is there a check for Revivify? No. There's not. But some people create checks or they'll have, like, mm. you know, uh, different checks for players to make to revive a character. Especially if the character d- wouldn't want to be revived, um, if that's something that they would not have wanted. Well, um, so... E- a lot of times that is specified yeah. in yeah. the spell. All of the, all of the revision spells. free soul that is yeah. willing. Yeah, the, will, the soul has yeah. to be willing to come back. Because if you yeah. die and you're like, I'm happy with my death. You can just say, nah, nah. I'm good. Peace I mean, out. It's yeah, been if, real. If no you thanks. look at the, the most popular uh, streamed show, uh, which is Critical Role, um, Matthew Mercer does have additional requirements, and he makes it harder each time if the same character goes down and they're trying to revive that character. It It's progressively harder to revive that character, um, basically because the rules just say, you cast this spell and they come back. And he explained in, in some of the interviews that he's given or discussions that he's given about his requirements for it, it that didn't seem to have the gravitas or the weight required of such a thing. And so he added additional requirements, which is called homebrew rules, which basically every game has modifications to the rules that the group agrees upon in order to make the best gaming experience for them. Yeah, like for instance, I don't think we're paying attention to encumbrance or things like that, or attunement we haven't really necessarily bothered with because we haven't had uh, that many magical (laughs) items. But a lot of people don't like to deal with like the inventory management side of things. Like that's not necessarily a lot of, I think a lot of um, groups ignore that component because it's just a lot of work, but it's written into the rules. Absolutely, D&D 5th edition has all kinds of rules available for inventory management. Encumbrance rules are optional in D&D. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Also, (laughs) thankfully, is this... Is this Matthew Mercer, the actor? Yeah. Yeah, the voice actor. Cr- the voice actor. That's really cool. Okay, yeah, no, I was <laughs> like, oh, are there, like, two famous Matthew Mercers, or is this guy just doing all sorts of stuff? Yeah, he That's does cool. all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. All, all the people on all Critical Role are voice actors. Uh, you might, like, if you've seen, like, The Last of Us, like, Laura Bailey is on the show. Ashley Johnson. Um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Anyway, sorry. I'm just. I'm learning all there's sorts a, of things today. There's a lot of content there, so you know, don't be yeah. overwhelmed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They've no, been playing I've, their um... campaigns for years. <laughs> yeah. For they're years. they're, they're finally. Two. Yeah. They're on their second campaign, and like, it's it's still going pretty strong, and they're well past the episode count for their first campaign. So. Wow. Fun times. Um, yeah. I definitely. I yeah. mean, I've heard of Critical Role, but I've never never watched it or listened to it or anything yeah. so that's yeah and that's a lot of people's frame of reference because it is one of the most popular D uh shows out there uh for mm-hmm. rules but the a lot of a lot of groups would prefer to just revive their characters and have them stay alive as much as possible uh, especially like groups that want to like make it to an epic level campaign and you know want to be challenged mm-hmm. and some of that challenge comes with the characters going down but yeah like for instance arla's a druid Arla has access to... I didn't prepare Revivify because I didn't think that we would really need it. Um, I prepared a lot of healing spells and I figured I Mm -hmm. could probably just manage to heal people up if they went down to zero. Um, Yeah. And I also gave us that uh, Heroes Feast to make sure that everybody had a... And there's always reincarnation. Yeah. So... Yeah. Said the Druid. Yeah, no, I was was just just curious. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's it is an important topic, and I would argue if you're going to homebrew out the standard rules in D and D and make it harder to bring people back, that that's a conversation your DM should have with you from the beginning, because it does give it yeah. one. It it might change the character you make because maybe you make a less reckless character um, mm-hmm. if you know that they're if they die they're gone and it's it's very hard for them to come back. But it's also sort of that's a that's a pretty major change. Like Wizards of the Coast specifically designed fifth edition to be harder to die and to be harder to permanently lose a character. They've said that explicitly um, because they're trying to get as many people involved and losing a character, especially if it's your first or second time playing, could put you off of playing the game. Um, Because if you get emotionally invested in something and then it's violently killed. Uh, for you uh, that might not be uh, the fun time experience that you were hoping for when you start playing D&D so um, yeah definitely should be a conversation up front so you know you know what you're doing you can design it that way and you have the expectation that you may lose this character um, and that that would be easier to happen now 
Yeah, and especially since building a character can take some time. Like, even Mm -hmm. as people who are experienced with building characters, like, you know, that's not so bad. But if you're, especially for a campaign where you're building a character with a backstory and, like, you've put some thought into their personality and you've written it all down and you've got all of that set up, it's a lot. It's a lot of time investment to build a character and then have them, you know, die off. Um, and have to do it all again, especially if you have like a weekly session and it's like, well, ne- by next week, get that next character up. Um, some people have backup characters, especially if they know, if you know ahead of time that, you know, you might, your character might die, you would probably prepare a couple. Yeah. And some of might us just have a, a full like tavern full of backup characters. <laughs> like I'm looking at Anthony and I. It's just like, here's all these. I don't know these. why you're looking at me. I only have like seven or eight backup characters. I know. <laughs> That's it. Only. Well, yeah. so for. Just like a conference room. For <laughs> the longest yeah. time, like, I, I started really playing um, role playing games in high school. Um, but then I graduated from high school. And I didn't have anyone to play with. And so for the longest time, my only engagement with role-playing games was I had a bunch of rule books. And so if I wanted to do anything with them, I just created a character. And so like that was my only access to this medium that I really loved was character creation. And so that's just a thing that I do. I get an idea and I go and roll up the character, just the basic outline of it. Um, because I enjoy making characters because for a long time that was all I could do. Yeah. Making characters is, and it is yeah, fun. one of the funnest parts yeah. of the game. It's, it's just like if I get a video game that has a character creator at the, creator at the beginning, I know that like the first the first time I play that, it's going to be like three hours of character creation and nothing else. That's fair. <laughs> one of the things I like to do, actually, one of my favorite things about one shots is a chance to try out a character that I'm I've made and I'm not sure about. Um, so you can sort of play them in a low low stakes situation like i'm only going to play this character this one time and um we'll see if i like i enjoy it and then that way i can usually walk away and go i would be interested in playing this character for a longer campaign if i if i get the chance or no no thanks that was fun for a one shot maybe but um i don't think i could put up with that character for you know however long a campaign might last (laughs) yeah i have a character i want to play again that i played in the monty hall one shot that you did um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I made a pixie uh, barbarian and I absolutely loved the character um, and have to actually play that character sometime. Yep. I love that. <laughs> I want to see this character, a pixie barbarian. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, they all, yeah. we played a Monty Hall campaign, which, oh wow, how to explain Monty Hall campaigns. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what I don't Monty know. Hall is. We, <laughs> yeah. We don't have enough time to go into like a whole thing, so I'll I'll give the short version. Okay. 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 So a, a Monty Hall campaign. Monty Hall refers to a game show host from uh, the U.S. in the mid uh, what mid sixties through seventies. I just looked him up. Is this um, the guy from Let's Make a Deal? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Cool. So it's like a um, you know it's like ridiculous. You know you expect there to be like just ridiculously powerful uh, antagonists or ridiculous situations. Typically you are playing a character that is not standard. So in this game that we're talking about, we were all uh, monsters, monsters as the category from the monster manual. So like pixies, I was a quaddle, which is like a flying serpent. Um, You know, there's uh, so it's, a strange had a demi lich type a, a mini terrace we had a demi lich <laughs> yeah i love and that and then um, usually you're also very powerful so you may be a high level character or you may um, be kind of like a moderate level character with very powerful magical yeah. and items. for the one that we did so, we went we started at like first level and by the end of the session we were 20th level yeah oh, wow <laughs> i that's so that's so cool i love that they're they're usually ridiculous too. So, like they're intended to yes. not be serious. Like that that adventure ended with one of our yeah. friends, uh, who was a bard to ask, attempting to dance the world to non-existence. 
like like finding <laughs> the perfect harmonics of standard. the universe in order to <laughs> yeah, like cause it to shatter Hawkeye. completely from like the fabric of reality. But um, it it was a character that I created. I created a backstory for the character. I like built a character and like mechanically having a um yes having a pixie that was a barbarian like barbarians are very fighty with like physical attacks here's this tiny tiny little creature and it's like well if i come across a better weapon like had to think of like mechanically how does my pixie deal with a great sword that is built for an orc and oh, basically just intrinsic magic that I touch it and it becomes sized for me and then I can use it. Um, kind of like taking, if you've seen Ant-Man, uh, where yeah. he shrinks down and gets a lot stronger. Uh, kind of kind of like that concept embodied into the character. But I created mm. this character that I really loved, used it for that one uh, really ridiculous game. And I'm like... I want more of that character. I want to revisit <laughs> that character. There's backstory there that I want to have explored in an actual campaign sometime. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a backup character that's, like, in my back pocket waiting for the right campaign to bring it out again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. That makes me think it's a good time to transition to our, our kind of last set of questions. Um thinking about works of literature that might work in a Monty Hall campaign. Um, so that was actually what I was just are there, thinking. <laughs> I was like, how can yeah, we bring a there, Monty Hall so, adventure you know, to <laughs> the role play? We could do it. I think we could. Uh, here's um, Anthony's Xanth series. Uh, it is a series that is 90% puns. Hmm. That's a lot of puns. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. That's a lot of puns. <clears throat> there is a beverage right. in it. Sounds... So just as an example, the one that comes to Perfect. mind, there is a beverage in it called Boot Rear. Just... And when you drink it, you get the sensation of a boot kicking your rear. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guide to the Galaxy. I feel like, yeah, that would be... <laughs> that could definitely be a money home. I think there's definitely some of the Discworld novels by Terry Pratchett would definitely fall into that... Mm styling um i mean honestly has, alice in wonderland i was gonna say alice in wonderland too would have been <laughs> yeah. perfect for something like that you know um yeah be you interesting could do it with other other properties too like you could do um it's not necessarily li necessarily literature unless you want to base it on the novels or the comic books but like star wars you could easily do a monty, oh, hall, yeah. monty hall campaign in that universe um, it's just which aspects of that universe do you want to highlight and bring forward? Yeah, Flatland or Flatterland mm -hmm. would also sure. work um, for those of you. I don't remember the authors, but I do remember reading them for math class. Um, Flatland as in the, like, everybody's two-dimensional? Yeah. What? All right, you're going to have to explain that one. You can't just throw out Flatland as Wait. an answer for a Monty Hall campaign. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you'd have a little bit of... Um, who what 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 characteristics people had but i think that there's a lot of like leveling up very quickly and having a lot of ridiculousness to the world especially flatterland which has a lot more which is like the sequel to flatland but not by the same author i should remember who wrote that mm. um has a lot of like i just think of how free the world was especially in flatterland and how there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of things that could be manipulated by people, I think, um, like within the parameters, because that was yet again something that had a lot of like uh, commentary on social norms of the time. But like there was a lot of available um, kind of like absurdity that could happen, like the fact that like lines could hurt people just by existing and that if you went too close to one that you could just like run into them and like hurt yourself. Um, you know, things like that. Um, I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of abs absurdity available there. Gaspo, sorry. <laughs> uh, on those same lines, you could do uh, Shishin Liu's uh, The Three Body Problem. And, and that actual series uh, would have some of the same... Because uh, there's a lot of exploration of higher, mm -hmm. dimension, uh, higher dimensionality and stuff like that. 
Mm, interesting. Oh, I'm, kind of I'm also like... thinking of, um, I'm going to look up the author. Uh, Green Grass Running Water. Um, let me look up the author. Thomas King. Um, Native American trickster novel. Um, and it is very, like, fluid. Like, like all these characters from that are some of them are fictional interacting with non-fictional characters they like pop in and out of stories and scenes and it's weird too because there's also like an actual narrative running across like in between all of this stuff um but really any native american like trickster novel would probably work well because a lot of them have a lot of that like play of a world that is manipulated and almost um can can is is part of a flow it doesn't have to follow like a strict set of rules um because i mean that's the nature of the trickster mm -hmm. in general i'm also thinking now of things like uh six characters in search of an author waiting for yeah. gado uh the iceman oh yeah uh, those are all on our <laughs> list of uh yeah. stories yeah uh i'm not i'm not super familiar with a lot of like classic literature however two that do or i guess one that comes to mind is um uh the original like peter and wendy like the original peter pan novel um because mm -hmm. neverland is kind of so very similar to like wonderland in this very like fantastical place um and and then also i haven't read a lot of his novels i've read more of his short stories but kurt vonnegut does a lot of like yeah post or like apocalyptic like dystopian mm -hmm. type uh stories which i think would be interesting yeah I, I, um but yeah those are yeah. I, I had been thinking animal farm um or oh i think that Ooh, oh no sorry go ahead oh i was also gonna say or um uh kafka's metamorphosis mm -hmm. that one's also <gasps> on yeah. oh yeah. my gosh i hate yeah. that book <laughs> It horrified me. It is very me. upsetting. It was probably, like, yeah. I, I'm no joke, probably the most upsetting thing I have, like, physically, like, upsetting thing I've ever read in my entire life. I read it when I was, like, a sophomore in high school, and I was so sad for days afterwards. I was like, this poor man, he is a bug, and he is dead, and I feel so sorry for him. <laughs> wow, spoilers. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Gosh, Danny. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh. No, pe if people haven't read The Metamorphosis by Kafka, it's yeah. Also, I mean, yeah. is it really a spoiler? Can you spoil Kafka? I don't Kafka know. is an experience. I don't think so. Let's be honest. I read Kafka is an experience. Just knowing how it ends does not no. mean that you have read that That's word. true. Has anyone read, um, there's this one Kafka short story called The Penal Colony, and it's about this guy who makes, like, this machine that inscribes your punishment into your back. And then as it happens, you end up dying. But it's such a slow death that you reach, like, this nirvana and then die. It's so interesting. It was another one that I had to read for school. And I was, like, it was, in my opinion, a lot less upsetting than The Metamorphosis. It was more mm. interesting as opposed to, like... I am going to be sad now after reading this. <laughs> Sounds like Kafka. Kira from the chat has said that's a great slash awful And also one. that you cannot spoil Kafka. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, also agrees that you cannot I'm going to plug, if you have never seen it, there is, I will, I will always say this anytime someone brings up Kafka, there is a video <laughs> by the Onion News Network called the Kafka International Airport. <laughs> It is one of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen. It is amazing. And if you it have not watched it, it, you should go out and time. watch it immediately after this <laughs> podcast. It's, I love, wait, I love The Onion. I'm going to, I'm going to watch this as soon as we're yeah, done. Yeah, you should watch it. It is amazing. I still every now and then reference it uh, to my brother <laughs> who also really enjoys it. Um, oh, it's classic, classic Onion yep. News Network. <laughs> Um, but another book that would back on topic uh, that I just thought of that would yeah. fit really well into this is also Paper Girls, um, a graphic novel series by um, Brett Vaughn. Wait, yeah, Brett. Is his last name Vaughn? I think it is. Cat. Mm, now I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> I just can't remember anyone's name right now. Uh, is the and uh, I remember Brian Flatland Vaughan. is by Flatland is by Edwin Abbott Abbott because mm. for his mother's Abbott. last name and his father's last name because they were cousins um, <laughs> or something like that. I remember uh, that. I remember discussing that. Mm. Um, Brian Vaughn, not Brett Vaughn. If 
thought something seemed wrong. But Paper Girls is really great for that sort of thing. Mm. That now I want to run a Paper Girls one shot. Um, this see? is just an I, this, this is, is a brainstorming session for our next very helpful. our next sessions. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what this has become basically. We got planned for the fall, you know. I mean, yeah, I, I put a yeah. lot of like surrealist fiction on onto our list of potential works that we would want to see adapted. Um, so I, I definitely want to see some Haruki Murakami uh, brought in here, but I don't know if it necessarily a Monty Hall campaign appropriate way to approach it. Yeah. I can't, yeah. is it? It's not Murakami. Um, ooh, I feel like you could definitely do also, like, because I've been thinking about doing some of the, like, beat works, um, but I could see that also working into a sort of a kind of Monty Hall mm. campaign. Um, yeah, that could be really interesting. Yeah, I thought so. So um, you you brought up Murakami, and I I always whenever think of Japanese literature, think of the sailor who fell from grace with the sea. Which I talk I talked to Kayla about that, and I was like, that would be an interesting story, but I don't know that we could run it as a one shot. There's a plot, um, and it's not by Murakami; it's by Yukio uh, Mishima. But I don't know about running that one. So, like the plot of the story is there are these like children, and they idolize this sailor. And they eventually decide he's he doesn't live up to their like idolization, and they decide to kill him. Um, and so like that's yep. the it takes a turn there, doesn't so it? So that's like pre spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Like all that happens pretty early in the book. <laughs> and I was like, there's a very clear plot to this, but also I don't know that anyone wants to role play as like kids trying to kill a sailor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sound fun. <laughs> yeah, you could definitely riff on the themes of like people. I don't know. That's I don't know not the living. actual work, so not to living your up to your expectations and like how you and confront yeah. that. Uh, I mean, we've talked to to several times about doing manga potentially yeah. for, uh, yeah, for an episode. And there's so much, there's so much good stuff there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. I was actually lots, I, lots of lots of great stuff. I was thinking for like a Monty Hall campaign, like if anyone if this isn't I mean, well I guess there is a manga adaptation, but if anyone likes Neon Genesis Evangelion, like post uh you know, 'cause it's I mean it's kinda like in a post apocalyptic world. Um, I feel like that would that would work with these like, you know, supernatural beings and um, you know, humans driving these like overpowered mechs yeah. i feel like that would be really cool i love that universe so much it's like one of my favorite like works of fiction ever yeah i wrote a i wrote a paper one time about existentialist philosophy as it relates to neon genesis evangelion <laughs> uh, <laughs> i probably shouldn't be the one to run that because i feel like the adventure would be super depressing for all of the players <laughs> i would love that i i i well, okay, here's the thing. I'm like of the, I don't know if this is a popular or unpopular opinion and this is I will I, we don't have to like get into it, but I I feel like Neon Genesis Evangelion is in it it at the in its core, I feel like it is very hopeful and to me it's a very like uplifting story about resilience uh even in the midst and like uh self-love mm-hmm. even in the midst of like the worst possible tragedy ever and so that's what really drew me to it it is mm-hmm. also depressing yeah. but i love yeah that's yeah anyway so that's here's also shinji is just here's a hot take um about neon genesis evangelion <laughs> television ending is better than the movies i'm gonna throw okay that well wait uh, which which movie though any of them the television Any, ending that's from fair. from a philosophical standpoint, the television ending is the most existential piece of work that I think has ever existed in a medium that is not philosophy. Um, I yeah, <laughs> I love I love the TV ending. I also like the end of Evangelion movie because that's I feel like where yeah, but I like them both. I think they yeah. both complement each other really well. Yeah, I mean, one is the story of what's going on internally. The other is the story that's what's going on externally. And so yeah, they, I, you sort of need both, but I love the original ending and fight me. Tweet at me. I, I don't have someone, Twitter. <laughs> right. I saw someone argue <laughs> once that they like they aren't connected, and I was like, what are you – What did we watch the same show? Like they were like, oh, they're like different – they're different – Anyway, I digress. We Welcome to Genesis topics. Talk. Where I was going to say, this, is, this <laughs> no, has been this our podcast on Genesis Breath of the Talk. Wild and Genesis Jonathan. Talk. <laughs> right. Jonathan's making hot takes, so I think it's a good time for us to, for us to wrap <laughs> up. Uh, upcoming sessions that you're most excited about. Does anyone have any upcoming sessions of 
role of play that you're most excited about. I mean, I'm, I'm running Dante's Inferno, so I'm pretty excited about things that I am involved I'm, in. I'm hoping to play in that one. I don't know if I am, but either either the... I um, signed up. I'm, I, I'm signed up for either the play test or the actual like live play. I don't... Wait, when is know. it? Uh, Do you want to sign up, Danny? I can, uh, next week. I can Friday. slab some Dante's Inferno. <laughs> yeah, it's next week. We, you should sign up then. <laughs> you should absolutely. Uh, sign what day? Up. Yeah. What day? What Friday. day is it? March it's on Friday. Friday. Friday at six oh. p.m. This Friday, March twenty-six. <laughs> okay. I t TBD. I will let. I will. I will contact Alice if that is something I can do. Yeah. Cause, let me know. Yeah. I'm. Yeah. Supposed to be doing. A session coming up. I don't remember what it is, though. Uh, it's Isaac Asimov. It's Nightfall. Yes, Asimov, Nightfall. I'm really excited for that one. I'm, I have a lot of thinking still exactly how to build that session. Um, but, um, and, and I'm going to be using the Cypher system, which I've played in but never run. So that will be uh, interesting. But I'm, I'm excited for that one. I'm excited for the one that was supposed to happen last weekend didn't. Um, which is uh, Lasers and Feelings based on uh, the Vada's War series by Elizabeth Moon, um, which is absolute, like, space opera, but slightly comic space opera. Um, uh, things are a little over the top, and it seemed like the perfect fit for the Lasers and Feelings system, which is um, made by the same people that made Honey Heist, uh, and mm -hmm. is a very basic, very simple system, and part of the gameplay is creating your character, and... Um, if you think of like old, um, kind of over the top sci-fi stuff like Buck Rogers or, or Star Trek, honestly, Flash Gordon, um, Flash Gordon like <laughs> those style would be references for like how the game plays. Um, yeah, I do oh, want to say, nice. <laughs> and that's a great point to plug if you, <clears throat> dear viewer, are uh, involved in libraries. If you are in the New River Valley, if you have anything to do with Virginia Tech, we want you to come play with us. <laughs> and uh, you can email us at rollofplay-g at vt.edu to let us know that you would be interested. Um, as we said before, also, you can tell us works of literature um, and we are defining that broadly, mm -hmm. some folks little bit of a stick in the mud. I'm just going to say it about what is literature. Oh. We are I not. You were, I thought now you we have Kayla's hot takes. I thought you were, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you were like, some of us, a stick in the mud <laughs> only chooses like Western literature. It's like, hey, no. I feel seen. No, no. <laughs> I chose a graphic no, novel. No, not a How reference to Jonathan. That's true. Yeah, we are. We're interested in lots of different types of literature because the purpose of this is uh, to improve literacy and excitement about literacy and also, you know, have fun. Yeah. Cause fun is also important. Absolutely. So also a hot take. Um, That's not a hot take. Fun's important. Yeah. Any <laughs> fun is important. That's why we're here. Um, yeah. If you want to want to play, definitely reach out to us. We will be back here for roll call two weeks from today to talk about, Sherlock Holmes. I just had it in Sherlock my brain. Holmes. Sherlock yes. Holmes. Yes. The first, potentially the first of two sessions, maybe, uh, of Sherlock Holmes um, that we had on the channel a few weeks ago. Yes. So. Yeah, we've got another one on the schedule, on the books. So probably first of two. Exciting times. The uh, our, our friend Kira, who DM'd that game, is saying, oh, right, that game. <laughs> so I should put that on my yeah. calendar. She should. I mean, it'd be great if you were. She there. should put it on her calendar, and so yeah. should you, yeah. uh, viewers. And uh, you know, come on back uh, and watch. Is that our song? And if you've missed any of our streams, you can watch them on our YouTube channel, which is linked in our about page. Are we rating oh, anyone? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Hold on. Oh, Let me check on that. I always forget what rating means. At first, I thought you said, are we rating anyone? I and I thought, thought this was going to be like a middle school, like, uh, rate me like this to get a rate. Something. I don't, like, I don't know what I I don't thought. like that at all. Let's not rate people. No, don't like, like and subscribe? Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know. No subscribe right now, but definitely uh, give us a follow. <laughs> 
uh, Follow. definitely, yeah. you know, like and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, <laughs> that's right. And yeah. Make sure you hit that bell icon. Yeah. That's, that's, what the, that's what the kids that's say. That's what the kids days. say. <laughs> that's what um, the kids say. So we are going to be raiding yeah. uh, NC State Libraries. They're doing a tilt brush demonstration right now, Ooh. looks like. Ooh. So uh, hopefully, awesome. hope, yeah, awesome. it should be a good time. So thank you so much for joining us. That sounds and, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for being here and for chatting and for offering your hot takes uh, and your feelings about Breath of the Wild. Uh, and Always other happy things. to do that. Lots of great content. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you all next Thanks, time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.